Most people rule out real estate investing as something they can do because they don't have the 20% down payment that's often required to purchase an investment property. But did you know alternate methods exist that can get you into a rental property with little to nothing down? On this episode, I tell my story of how I used lease options to control and later buy three rental properties which will hopefully give you some insight into how you may be able to do the same. Husband, father, entrepreneur, realtor, a long list of other titles and descriptions, and landlord. Welcome to the And Landlord Podcast with me, Jonathan Taylor Smith, also known as JT. Following a roadmap to financial freedom through residential rental real estate. Welcome to the And Landlord Podcast, 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 And and, 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 and Lord and Lord Podcast. Welcome to episode number 29, Making Deals with Lease Options how I've done it. So how do you get into a rental property with little to nothing down? One method is called seller financing, but in full disclosure, I've not done a seller finance deal directly yet. So I'll talk more about that later once I've actually done one myself. But what I have done is a lease option deal. In fact, I've done three. And then I later completed each purchase a year or two after the lease term started. If you're not aware, a lease option is a two-part contract, the lease and the option to buy. And it's an option to buy, not a requirement, but more on that later. In a lease option deal, you are leasing the property for a period of time, essentially no different than would be the case for a tenant of any rental property but with a few additional provisions and considerations. And you then also have an option to buy the property at some later date for an already established price. It's a two-part contract because the lease portion establishes your right to control the property as if you were the tenant, but with the additional right to sublease to the actual live-in tenant of your choosing. And the option portion establishes your right to the property as the future buyer and sets your purchase price and other terms of the purchase, such as the date by which it must take place and several other factors. The option portion of the contract must be notarized and gets recorded against the title or deed of the property at your local register of deeds office. This prevents the owner from selling the property to anyone else but you during the option period. So with a valid lease option contract in place against a property, you effectively fully control that property, depending on the specific terms of the arrangement, but you don't actually own it yet. So I've successfully done three lease option deals to date. In order, they were my fourth, fifth, and sixth properties acquired And I count the establishment of the lease option as the acquisition date, even though I didn't actually complete the purchases until a year or two later for each. I got each of these properties under lease option contract within months of each other in 2016 and completed the purchases of two of the three in 2017 and the third in late 2018. All three of these properties were in the same townhouse community where my very first rental property is located that I acquired in July of 2015. Of course, I liked this community, so I started sending monthly direct mail pieces to every townhouse owner, but most didn't respond. Some who did respond were completely unreasonable, especially those who were investors owning the properties as rentals. One investor offered to sell me his rental units in the community for $150,000 each, whereas I had bought mine for just under $61,000. And these units aren't even worth that much today, let alone back in 2016. They're worth about $135,000 now. But over time, 
Some owners started to respond who were not completely unreasonable in what they wanted for their properties. That's when it got interesting. One owner called who owed just under $70,000 on their two-bedroom, 1.5-bath townhouse in the community, but I didn't know what they owed at the time. They wanted to sell it to me for that amount. While today, I would jump all over that with a full cash offer and have it closed in a week or two, back then, cash was tight. And I knew that most of these units needed something like $10,000 of rehab and upgrades to be rental ready. Also, this would have been my fourth investment property purchase. I had done the first three in my personal name along with my wife, but qualifying for each was getting progressively more difficult. I had to put down 25% on the third just to make it work, whereas I was able to put down 20% on the first two. So I didn't think I could qualify and have sufficient down payment funds plus reserves as required to close on this property conventionally. Further, I just didn't want to pay $70,000 when I had bought the first for just under $61,000 that just happened to be identical and literally right next door. And it was not in as good of condition either. So I offered them $61,000 and I was going to do whatever I needed to complete the purchase at that amount using conventional financing. But they refused the offer. And like I said, I didn't know why at the time, but I later learned that it was because they owed $70,000 or almost that amount. So accepting my offer at $61,000 would mean that they'd have to come up with about $9,000 at closing, money that they did not have. So they decided to look into listing it with a realtor or maybe doing a short sale. I also tried to speak with them about doing a lease option as a potential solution but they weren't interested, and then things went silent with them. So months went by, during which I continued sending direct mail pieces to every house, except that investor who had multiple units and gave me a ridiculous price of $150,000 each. Then I got a call from another prospective seller in the community. This time it was an end unit, three bedroom with one full bath and two half baths. They were upside down, owing about $80,000. But the most I could pay is about $70,000, considering it again needed over $10,000 of rehab and updates to be rental ready. So I suggested a lease option as a solution right from the start. And I scheduled an in-person meeting to go over how everything would work to our mutual benefit. It was my first in-person seller meeting. I was so nervous that I had to focus a portion of my attention on making sure my hands weren't shaking, which then resulted in my legs bouncing. Somehow I got through it and gave a credible enough presentation that they agreed to do a lease option deal with me where I'd buy the townhouse for $69,900 at some point within the next two years with an optional third year upon payment of an additional $1,000. And between now and then, I directly pay only one half of the monthly mortgage payment, which included escrow for taxes and insurance. And I'd pay all of the monthly HOA fee. I couldn't pay the full mortgage plus escrow payment and still have the needed monthly positive cash flow. So it had to be one half plus HOA. I'd also be responsible for paying any other expenses associated with the property, including any needed rehab, updates, repairs, maintenance, everything. So if the HVAC went out, I'd have to pay for it or a replacement. And since the option portion of the contract must be accompanied by some exchange of value, I paid a $100 option fee, which is non-refundable, but does get credited back to me as a prepayment at purchase closing when that occurs. I didn't get any credit for my HOA or one half mortgage payments over the lease term, but my payments towards the mortgage along with the other one half from the seller over that two year period resulted in his no longer being upside down 
once I completed the purchase years later. In fact, he got some money back at purchase closing. So the benefit to the seller was that they started something like $10,000 upside down with the townhouse that needed maybe another $10,000 of rehab work. They had just gotten married and his spouse already had a house they were moving into, so they didn't need this second house, but couldn't sell it being upside down and couldn't rent it out being in need of lots of work. That is, if he even wanted to try his hand at being a landlord. And he didn't. Then weeks after I had this first lease option established, that first potential seller who had decided to look into selling with a realtor or maybe doing a short sale and had gone silent on me, they called again and wanted to speak with me further about a lease option. I'm not sure what happened. Maybe they had spoken to the other seller that I had done a deal with a short time earlier. Whatever it was, they were now interested in hearing more. So I scheduled an in-person meeting to discuss it, and an amazing thing happened. I wasn't nervous. I was now experienced at this. I knew that I could do it. I had done it before, and now I knew better what to say and how to say it. We had a great meeting, but they wanted to think about it. They were getting married also. And just like the first seller, they didn't need two houses, couldn't sell this house due to being upside down, and didn't have the money needed to rehab it into a rental, nor did they have any desire to become a landlord. And even more so than the first seller, they really needed to get out from under the mortgage and HOA payments for this unwanted townhouse. A few days later, they called and said they wanted to proceed, but... Whereas the first deal had an option fee of only $100, this seller wanted $1,000, but not paid to them. They were way behind on their HOA payments. So my $1,000 option fee was to be paid directly to the HOA to bring them current. And I would still get credit for this amount at purchase closing. The mortgage payment here was a lot lower than on the first deal. So I agreed to pay their entire monthly mortgage payment directly including escrow for taxes and insurance, along with the HOA fee as well. Like I said, they needed to be free from all payments towards this house. But this seller didn't want to go out two or three years on the option period. So we agreed to 18 months with an optional additional six months for $1,000 paid to them this time if that occurred. And that was just a protection for me. I don't know what the economic conditions are going to be 18 months from now or what my personal financial circumstance would be. So I just like to have an additional cushion, even if it costs me a little extra. I got everything drawn up by my attorney and ready for notarizing. And then they called and said they had changed their mind again and now no longer wanted to proceed. So I said, hey, the choice to proceed or not is 100% up to you, but I'm happy to have another call or stop by to discuss any concerns. So we had another call and I learned that they had gone to a party or something that prior weekend and mentioned to a family friend who I think may have also been an attorney and they were scared out of proceeding by whatever that person told them. I think their main concern had to do with potentially being sued by my future tenant, they're still being the property owner, or me failing to pay the bills as agreed, and just tying up their house with no real intention of buying it. Remember that a confused or scared mind just says no. So I followed up the call with what must have been a highly persuasive email, because a few days later they called again and wanted to meet with me once more. I scheduled that meeting at one of my other rental properties, the third one that was still vacant at the time, and they again agreed to proceed. I said, great, and I quickly arranged to have the lease signed and option contract notarized and recorded. And note that I purposely had that meeting at one of my other properties 
so they could see that I was already doing this and own properties nicer than what I was potentially buying from them. I don't know if it had any impact, but it's also worth noting that I have nice business cards, a great website, a great company brand name, and that name is Blue Chariot. And I drive around in a very nice blue Ford F-150 with Blue Chariot signs all over it. It may mean nothing, but I think presentation and credibility matters when you're asking someone to trust you. Trust that you will improve their property, that you will pay all the bills on time as agreed, and that you will eventually buy the house. But until then, please give me full access and control over your house for essentially nothing. I don't think that you can pull that off if you don't look and sound like you are legitimate, real, honest, trustworthy, knowledgeable, experienced. So long story short, I got the property rehabbed and rented. And around 15 months later, I completed the purchase and the seller got a nice check at closing. They had gone from being upside down to having a profitable sale. They also gave me a great testimonial and they're now one of the people I'll have potential private lenders and sellers speak with to learn if I'm a person of my word and able to do what I say. They are the perfect reference because they went in scared and came out whole and happy with everything happening exactly as I said it would. So now at this point, I've got five rental properties and the last two were via lease option. And then I get another call from a relative of an owner in the same community. She knew the seller of the first lease option deal that I had done and wanted me to speak with her relative about potentially buying his slightly upside down townhouse as well. So were these people responding to my mailings? Did they see my truck driving through the community with blue chariot signs? Or was it all just the result of comments or referrals from that first seller that opened the door to consideration of a lease option deal by the others? Who knows? Who cares? I was now sitting in the living room of the third potential seller within this community and my days of being nervous about speaking with them was long gone. I presented the values and benefits of doing a lease option deal with me and this seller agreed as well. And unlike the others, he was not significantly upside down, just a little. And the property was not in all that much need of rehab compared to the others. He had done a nice job at keeping it well-maintained and clean. Also, unlike the others, he wasn't getting married to a spouse who already had a house they were moving into, but I think he was changing jobs and needed to relocate. So here I agreed to pay $72,500 for the three bedroom, two bath townhouse within 18 months with again an optional six months pushing it out to two years for another $1,000. And I agreed to pay the full monthly mortgage payment including escrow for taxes and insurance plus the monthly HOA fee but the option fees kept getting higher. This time I paid $3,000 as an option fee directly to the seller, which again, I got credited back to me at closing of the purchase about two years later as a prepayment towards the purchase price. So there you have it. That is the condensed version of how I took down my fourth fifth, and sixth properties as lease option deals. The first cost me only $100 up front to the seller as an option fee. The second was $1,000 paid to the HOA. And the third option fee was $3,000 paid to the seller. Additionally, I had to pay for all needed rehab of the properties as needed to make each rental ready. 
This all may sound like a lot, but 1,000 or even 3,000 is nothing compared to 20% down on a $70,000 property. That's 3,000 versus 14,000 or so. And then you still have the same additional expenses for rehab either way. But let's speak on that for a moment. Let's say that my rehab expense for one of the properties was $9,000 and each lease option went for at least 18 months. That comes out to $500 per month. And without accounting for reserves, each of these properties generated positive cash flow of at least that amount. This means that by the time I completed each purchase up to two years later, I had little to no money remaining in the property. The property that I didn't even own yet had produced enough positive cash flow to pay for itself and pay me back. That essentially makes these free houses. But it got even better. Over the term of the option period, these properties had increased in value. So I wanted to get a bank loan based upon the current appraised value and maybe take some cash out myself at purchase. But the problem with that is that most conventional lenders, or at least those that I reached out to, would not do a cash out loan based upon 75% of the current appraised value because I didn't already own the properties for the required one year of seasoning. A lease option is not ownership, and you can't do a cash out purchase from a lease option, or at least not with a conventional lender. So what I did instead, I got a private lender to fund my purchase of each property at 80% of the current appraised value, but it was at 9% interest, which is likely twice what I would have paid to a conventional lender under my personal name. This put some cash in my hand for each property, but it also increased my monthly payments. So monthly cash flow decreased, but I had gotten all my money back out of each property. So they truly were now free properties. And my ROI on the remaining positive cash flow was essentially infinite as I no longer had any of my own money invested. And then a year later, I was able to refi the private lender out on two of the three. And in those cases, I was able to pull out still more cash as the properties had continued to increase in value. And since I now had actually owned them for a year, I could do a cash out refi. I expect to be able to do the same on the third when I refi the private lender out on that one within the next few months. And despite the mortgage on the property getting larger, my monthly payments decreased because the interest rates went from 9% to something like 5.5% under my LLC. So it was a multi-step process, but I had successfully taken three properties from being upside down for the sellers to being positive cash flow rentals for me and now with a ton of equity present in each and put cash in the seller's hand at purchase closing. But how or why did this work? And can it still be done today in the current market condition? Was this something that worked in 2016 or 2017, but has no chance of working here in 2019 or the coming year, 2020? In all honesty, I can't answer that question with 100% certainty as I shifted my focus, possibly mistakenly, from single family homes, trying to get multifamily properties and even apartment complexes. So I've not been pursuing opportunities for additional lease option deals this year. But my gut instinct is that now that I'm looking for single family homes again, I will continue to do lease option deals wherever it makes sense, but it has to make sense. So what are the elements that need to be present for a lease option to be attractive to the seller? There does need to be a reason for it. If the property owner has a pristine house that's in move in ready condition, ready to sell at top market price and less is owed 
than the value, then why would such an owner not just sell the conventional way? Of course, that's what they'll do. They're certainly not going to be doing any lease option deals. They don't have to. In two of my three lease option deals, the sellers had just gotten or were in the process of getting married and their spouses already had houses into which they were planning to move. They didn't need the house I was seeking to buy, but they couldn't sell it conventionally due to being upside down and not having the money to cover the difference. And then the plan B of renting it out was also blocked because the house needed lots of rehab and updates to make rental ready. And they had no desire to become landlords anyway. So in other words, there were multiple pain points, all of which were solved by the lease option. So while it is less common for someone to be upside down in the current market with home values at or near all-time highs, I recommend targeting pre-foreclosures, tax liens, and tax delinquencies. Also, not a bad idea to target landlords of existing rentals where the property is physically distressed or they just had an eviction or code violation and there are a high number of vacant properties. You can also target any house that needs significant rehab work to be rental ready or to sell at market price, and you can find them just driving for dollars. Or do what I did. Find a neighborhood that you like and send direct mail to everyone in it. So don't say it can't be done. Don't say it worked then but can't work now. A lease option is a viable solution for the right circumstance of problems. Use it just as you would any other tool in your belt as a transaction engineer. It can work great when you don't have a lot of money. It can also work great when the rehab actions needed at a property can be paid by credit card, especially if you have access to zero interest promotions. And an additional selling point is that the owner continues to get the full tax benefits, mortgage interest deduction, and any escrow refunds during the option period. Now, if you have additional questions about lease options or you want access to my contract, terms, provisions, and all, including my phone and email scripts, talking points, checklists, and more, I'll be working on some premium content that I'll be making available early next year. I've been reluctant to share these items For example, I've gotten multiple requests for my lease, but I have a problem sharing someone else's work product, which in that case would be the work of my attorney. So I'm working towards being able to share everything to that level in a membership section of the site in the near future. But until then, I hope that you found details such that I've shared here and in prior episodes of the podcast to be helpful. That's my goal to make this as informative a resource as I can that chronicles my journey and gives access to what I and others I occasionally bring on the show have learned along the way to thereby shorten your journey to the same and way beyond. Go out and do great things. And hey, let me know how I can help. Right now, I'm still conducting free 30-minute consultation calls with anyone having questions about real estate investing and being a landlord that I might be able to answer or provide some direction or insight, reach out and let's see if I can be of aid. It's free. Thank you for listening to the And Landlord Podcast with me, Jonathan Taylor Smith by Blue Chariot Media, following a roadmap to financial freedom through residential rental real estate. social media. I welcome your comments on the blog. 
And if you'd like to share your landlord horror story or have a comment or suggestion for the show, call 844-USA-BLUE and enter extension 263, which spells AND on your keypad, as in AND landlord, and leave a message. It may be used on a coming show. Thank you. Be all that you are. And, and landlord. Nothing on the preceding show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The comments and opinions of any guest are their own. Information is not guaranteed. Any investment may have potential for both profit and loss. The host is speaking solely on behalf of Blue Chariot Media, LLC.